Hi, this is Tom Vanderark from Getting Smart. We're talking middle grade math today with uh, math guru Tim Hudson from Dreambox Learning. Hi, Tim. Hey, how are you, Tom? And with us is the math maven Megan <laughs> Mead from Getting Smart. Hi, Megan. Good morning. Uh, Tim, you know, a lot of people in literacy say that there's a, a shift that has to happen in, um, in fourth grade where kids transition from reading to learn to learning to read and that there's a set of really core skills that sort of unlock uh, the, the rest of the world for, for young people. Are there, are there some similar foundational skills that you guys really try to work on uh, in third and fourth grade? Yeah, we, we consider like algebraic reasoning, which everyone talks about algebra one as the, as a, a gatekeeper, a break point. Success in algebra one so correlated with uh, right. what students do beyond that. Um, we definitely think that the algebraic reasoning that students do, and it's it's in the standards as well, like Common Core, for example, operations and algebraic reasoning starts really early. So really, I, don't, I think of that as sort of an algebra one high school kind of thing, right? But you you think it's uh, really important early. We tend to think of the, the ninth grade Algebra 1 as a more formalization where students are engaging in a far higher level of abstraction, way more variables, but operating in those same algebraic ways, like with the distributive property, with, with actual numbers rather than variables, and kids can be doing that quite early. We, uh, yeah, I guess one other thing I'd say about that, that, that breakpoint in literacy is there, there is a certain point where you have to understand the number system, and then you go on to sort of use the number system to model things uh, and complexity, whether statistics or in physics. So there's, there's kind of a break point there, I suppose, uh, but you really deeply need to understand the number system. When, when, when I think of uh, intermediate and middle grades and the, the really key skills that get kids ready for success in high school, I think of um, fractions. Uh, thinking in terms of, of ratios and, and proportionality is um, a lot of kids seem to struggle with that. Why, why is that? Yeah, there's, there's probably a, several different reasons. Um, one being a lot of times fractions are introduced in ways that, that um, are, are limiting for, for how kids need to broadly think about fractions as division, right. as ratio, as proportion. Like when you start off by saying here's, here's, uh, here's you know, four squares and, and two are blue and two are red and then you start talking about oh well two out of four that's a fraction that's yeah. um, that's a certain kind of a modeling of fractions but it ends up limiting how students think about fractions as numbers and yeah it's totally a critical understanding for algebra. Megan did you used to have uh, high school kids show up not getting fractions at all? Oh absolutely I mean I think that that was probably the most likely skill that we had to go back and reteach and I think it was a lot due to the fact that kids had learned all these different tricks um, throughout their elementary grades right. of how, so how to do things and what to do. Tricks, but they didn't really connect uh, fractions with proportionality. Is that... No, and I don't think they understood the, the true concept of what a fraction was representing. So but, it was that connection that was missing. So this is one of the cool things about both adaptive learning and game-based learning that you really do have a better chance of connecting um, the, the the mechanics that we're talking about with the, the understanding um, of fractions as proportionality, right? Yeah, and, and there's also uh, a great opportunity with, you know, sort of nonlinear sequencing where students can be engaging with fractional ideas in, in all of those different contexts and with all of, those, all of those different models in order to develop a more robust understanding rather than a really um, a narrow one. Like a, a similar thing that happens frequently in Algebra 1 is, you know, the first two months of Algebra 1 are spent on linear relationships and kids get so locked into the idea of linear y equals mx plus b that by the time you move on to exponentials, quadratics, uh, it's really hard for kids to break free of that idea that everything's a line. Uh, so having a more um, more connections throughout the curriculum and opportunities for students to engage with the same idea in different contexts is very critical. Uh, Jason Zimba, uh, one of the key authors of the Common Core Math Standards, read a blog on Getting Smart this week, and he said it was really important to ensure that a majority of students spend the majority of their time on on a set of power standards. Do you, do you also see it that way that there's a set of core concepts and you really do want to 
uh, focus, time, and attention on those? Yeah, and that's that's actually how Dreambox was designed from the very beginning. Uh, when Dreambox first uh, was released, it was only for K2 because we knew we needed to start very early. And right. at the time, the Common Core hadn't hadn't been written, hadn't been drafted, and we used the NCTM focal points. And so you see that same idea that there are at every grade level, um, there's pretty general consensus of what the important ideas in mathematics are developmentally. I, I say grade level, uh, but of course, <laughs> the the ideas depending on the age of the student are sort of <laughs> separate from that, but uh, yeah, we've, we've always focused on like the major clusters that are listed in the Common Core, were highlighted in the focal points. Um, you're working on content for, uh, for intermediate grades and thinking about the middle grades. How do you think about middle grade kids um, being different than the, the primary kids that you, you started serving? How are their brains different? How, yeah. how, how do you think about instructional design differently for them? So, yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question, something that we talk about all the time on our team. We, uh, one of the main things that is interesting is, you know, we have, we have virtual manipulatives. So we've taken things like a math rack, like a 10 frame, and we've not only digitized them in Dreambox, but we've also em empowered them with the kind of adaptivity that, that our platform offers. And, and we have lessons written by teachers, so we can ask kids different questions, better questions, uh, higher order thinking tasks than you could have asked previously with those manipulatives. Now, a six-year-old six will play with a math rack and kind of feel like it's a game. But if you take that same manipulative, or, or I'm sorry, if you take a manipulative and just digitize it for uh, a sixth or a seventh grader and say, hey, this is a math game, they're probably they're not going to believe you. They've played way too many games. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, we have to structure the engagement uh, a little bit differently. We have to give uh, different kinds of purpose to the task while still figuring out how to engage them with the manipulatives so they can make sense of things rather than, you know, as Megan said, just learn a lot of tricks. Interesting. So you, you may have to approach the math differently. You may have to skin the game differently. So there's a number of different dimensions you guys are thinking about. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, what do middle schoolers like, right? That's, uh, <laughs> that's the good question. It's an ever-moving uh, target. Tim, let's, let's talk about um, blended learning and, and how people might be using... Uh, Dreambox to, to complement uh, other forms of, of instruction. What there, Teachers can get a lot of data from Dreambox, right? How would you like to see that data used? Uh, always, you know, in the best interest of the student. I think, I think what blended learning sort of provides and, and what, what Dreambox and, and other software uh, can provide is, is information the teacher might not otherwise have. For example, uh, if students are able to compose numbers optimally. You know, if you think about our place value system, it is an optimal, you know, you could write 49 as 20 plus 10 plus 10 plus 9, but we write it as four tens, and, and I mean, it's, a, it's an efficiency sort of thing, and, and that's what right. mathematicians work for. Um, they look for optimal solution paths. So we can provide that sort of data to teachers uh, to give them insight into students thinking more deeply. I think on a, a, a more practical level, the struggle teachers have, and people have written on this quite extensively, is there's a, a broader range of diverse learners in today's classrooms. Right. Uh, you've got a fourth grade, a fifth grade, a sixth grade classroom. Uh, gosh, by the time you get to middle school, sometimes students are still working on third grade content. Right. So as, with, with Dreambox, we actually provide uh, the ad adaptivity for teachers to you know, trust that Dreambox will be engaging students where they need, and then providing that information to say, hey, they're making progress in third grade standards, fourth grade standards. We actually... We had one seventh grade student uh, using Dreambox over this past year, you know, who was at the first grade level, really, and the math coordinator mm -hmm. called me up to say, you know, this student was able to finish the first grade curriculum in, in about eight hours, and that's a key gap thing. It's less about the time yeah. and more about the rigor in our lessons to know that they really are, are deeply understanding those first grade things. So do some schools use um, the data from Dreambox to help uh, group small group instruction that might supplement it so that kids are have more of a, a coherent uh, math program? Yeah, that's one of the reports that we developed last year based on a lot of feedback we got from teachers, great ideas, was a teacher can pick a particular common core standard and with a single mouse click see which students in their class have completed that in Dreambox with proficiency, that they know it, which students are currently working on it and sort of how far along they are, and then which students haven't even gotten there yet in Dreambox. So, you know, if you're teaching um, yeah, let's see, what it, what, if you're teaching ratios and proportions uh, right. next week, you can go see which students already have some, uh, some insights and some understanding there 
that Dreambox has collected evidence of. And sometimes I think that means, you know, uh, setting up some sort of rotational model, some small group work so a teacher can manage that in the classroom. But I think other times right. it, it, it can actually just be used in the back of the teacher's mind to say, you know what, tomorrow, and this, this is something Jason Zimba uh, wrote in, in that article, you know, tomorrow we need this whole class to be together working yeah. on this problem, thinking about this. Um, it doesn't matter if you're working on 8th and ninth grade math or if you're working on 1st and 2nd grade math. It's an accessible task that's worth discussing as a community of mathematicians. That's cool. I, I wanted your opinion on that. I thought that was interesting that he said on a regular basis the whole class should could work on a well-designed, uh, carefully sequenced problem. It, it sounds like a lesson from Japan. Yeah, yeah, and it's actually uh, it's, it's embedded in sort of the DNA of Dreambox, too, that we've always uh, been designed to sort of complement great math communities in the classroom, and that's, you know, our advisors, uh, Skip Fennell and Kathy Fosno. Uh, Kathy Fosno has um, a ton of resources that would likely be considered sort of along the lines of the Japanese model, um, sort of in a, uh, in a comparable way, to say she's developing communities of mathematicians who engage each other, who tackle rich problems that have ambiguity, that have a lot of noise, where students have to think mathematically to sort through that noise, and, and really um, strengthen each other's ideas through rich conversation and, and proving your point in a, in a critical community, which is exactly what mathematicians do. Yeah, that's an exciting vision then for me of, of this adaptive, personalized learning, you know, along with what might be um, team-based, uh, authentic instruction around a real-world problem. And the combination of those two uh, seems like it could be really powerful. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, with, with blended learning, it's about being more thoughtful and strategic about the use of precious class time. So rather than saying, I have a class of 30 students and they're all over the place, they're very diverse and pr different levels of prior knowledge, but for the teacher to say, okay, you know, maybe we're using something like Dreambox so that students are getting that sort of personal workout that they need that we trust is rigorous and conceptual, but then I say as the teacher, okay, what are some things that we can only do that when we have this diverse range uh, of learners in a single classroom, that, that I as a parent, one thing that I can't provide is uh, a community of a bunch of other, you know, fifth or sixth graders who can refine my child's ideas. So having that rich dialogue um, not only is great for learning, but it also brings more purpose and value to, to give students reason to be at the school because you, you can't yeah. get that any, way, any other way. Tim, I, I want to go, go, oh, go ahead, Megan. I was just going to say it's interesting too as we look at middle school and it's such an interesting time for kids developmentally. Right. So, um, you know, when they have that peer interaction and everybody's voice is heard and they build off of each other, I think it does so much more for just the math but also to be able to talk through things. It's it's a, a big time of peer development and peer it, tutoring and things is, like that. It, it's very cool. I mean, one of the great things about games is that it's okay to fail. Right, and yeah. kids know that in both casual gaming and, and in Dreambox that there's supported failure and, and uh, it, it, instructional feedback that comes with it. But if a teacher can create that same kind of environment in a classroom where it's okay to struggle, right, where there's, the, the, there's peer support for struggle, not, not peer pressure against struggle, and where you can create that sort of a, an environment where it's okay to struggle um, in, in a team with a tough concept, that... Uh, that's really neat if it can be supported both in a in a game based environment like Dreambox and in a classroom. Absolutely. Yeah, I like to think of a, a of math class. The math classrooms I want for my kids are places where they can engage in really great thinking and dialogue, rather than as places where they they go to just acquire some information that yeah. arguably a calculator might be able to give them. Yeah. And I think too, I think too about. Uh, I read a I guess a New York Times article a few weeks ago about. Uh, a debate going on right now among the leading astrophysicists in the world, that there's something about the shape of space or the speed of light, I don't know, there's something that hasn't been resolved yet. There's a lot of theories out there. And one of the leading, uh, maybe they were at, at Berkeley or some high prestigious university, one of the leading astrophysicists, he said, you know, uh, for the past three months I've been in this camp. Uh, and I'll probably be there a little more, but you know, I might go back to my original thought that, that there isn't an answer yet and we would want students to, you know, maybe they leave a math classroom one day thinking, I'm not 100% convinced, but I'm going to think on it more. Yeah. Um, 
And and then one of the best days we had at a, a, a summer summer school program with Kathy Fosno was the next morning. A student came in and he's like, "I couldn't get to sleep last night because I was thinking about this problem. And here I changed my mind. I, I've got a new idea." That's <laughs> that, awesome. That's what we're shooting for. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's perfect. I, I want to wrap things up by going back to where we started and just underscored um, algebraic reasoning. I was so happy to hear you say that that starts early. When, when I think about what's the most important sort of mathematical understanding, in, in addition to a certain automaticity uh, of compu computational skills, the, the ability for kids to think about multivariable problems as they come into high school uh, seems so important to me, and I'm I'm glad to hear that uh, you think that starts early, and that you think um, a, a platform like Dreambox can help develop that. Yeah, uh, when I was a math coordinator, I came across a, a presentation one time where where someone asked the question, um, you know, what is pre-calculus? <laughs> that the idea of associating the, the term pre with a course, like we had some students in the district where I was the math coordinator who would take pre-algebra one in seventh grade pre-algebra yeah. 2 and 8th grade, and if they were still failing, they'd come to high school and take pre-algebra. That's three years of the same course, and arguably, yeah. mathematically, uh, from a curricular standpoint, we don't have pre-anything else. There's no pre-geography, right. no pre-Spanish. You just do it. And right. in, in Dreambox, we engage students in algebraic reasoning rather than, you know, that course was more designed as a, you need these skills before you can do this rigorous thinking. And right. I think we have plenty of experience in student performance data. Talk to any adult who didn't like algebra, and that idea that you're not ready for great thinking until you have some skills, I think, is, is problematic for learners. Yeah. That's great. It's been great to talk about math with uh, Tim Hudson from Dreambox. Thank you, Tim. Hey, thanks, Tom. It's been fun. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, thanks Megan. Tim.